give Laurel a big round of applause, please. Great job. Great job. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. David Ajipade. Uh, I'm going to run through a lot of slides. I am a medical doctor. I have uh, been treating, well, I would say managing cases of brain disorders. By the way, can you hear me all right? Okay. I know I have a bit of an accent. Uh, so if there's something you need me to go over, please don't be shy. I mean, I, I don't know why that should be. Um, I understand me perfectly, right? <laughs> so uh, feel free to, to, to bring me back whenever you feel like. So I do a lot with brain disorders. I'm actually from Nigeria, Africa, and uh, we do a lot with kids with, uh, well, both, both ends of the spectrum. Everything from autism, like Laurel mentioned, cerebral palsy, seizures. And then we, because of the results we're getting with kids, the government gave, gave us permission or basically we partnered with the government to actually address uh, problems in adults as well using our unique approach. Uh, so we do a lot with dementia, we do a lot with strokes, we do a lot with all other kinds of neurological conditions. And we do not use drugs at all. Um, I know that sounds really surprising. Uh, yeah, but um, not that we have anything against drugs. Definitely, you need to do everything your doctor asks you to do, but because we are in an environment where we, where we can't do even the simplest of tests, we can't do MRI scans. She mentioned vitamin D, <laughs> very few hospitals can do vitamin D, and it's super, super expensive. So we had to make do with using the safest, most effective ways possible. And so we started looking into um, Alzheimer's disease, and we started treating Alzheimer's disease quite successfully back home. I mean, not that they, uh, got completely well, but the, the bottom line was that we wanted them to be functional, to be able to function, to remember. Everybody faces memory loss, right? I'm going to get into that in a minute. But everybody faces memory loss in some form, form or the other. I hope this is working. So we're going to start with memory problems. Everybody, I mean, until we turn 40, on average, people begin to have memory issues. Is anybody here who does not have any memory issues at all? Your memory is like what you used to be when you were 17, 18, or 19. Yeah. Raise your hands real quick. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody. It is a problem. So the question is, what is it? Is it just normal aging? And everybody experiences that. You go into a room, you forget why you went to the room, or you, forget, you don't know where you kept your keys is its cognitive decline, which is now called mild cognitive decline. Cogn Cogn MCI, what's the I stand for again? Impairment. Impairments, that's right. I would say cognitive decline. So mild cognitive impairments. The difference is just that it's, one is the degree, how frequently that happens, and how it gets in the way. If it's becoming a bother, then it's probably more, more like a mild cognitive impairment. Or is it Alzheimer's disease? problem is you may not really know which of them it is. The only way you can know for sure is if you do the elaborate tests, and as some of you may have explained, I, I, I kind of like give some examples of what's, how they do, differ from each other, and we can provide the slides for you afterwards, so there's no problem there. But here's the thing, if you don't know for sure, there are three scenarios that could turn out. One, it could progress to full-blown dementia, 10% within the first year, and another 35 40% within the next five years. Some will improve automatically. Maybe you had a, a, a loss in the family, you were facing grief, you were depressed, that can kind of impair your memory, and when that period is over, you return, you revert to your normal memory. The third, of course, it could be the same. It's just one of the problems you have. I mean, everybody ages differently, right? I, I look around, I see some men with a full head of hair, others maybe not so much. So everybody, depending on your genes, you all age differently, and same thing with memory. The question is, how can you tell which it is? I mentioned that already, that basically we have to run through a barrage of tests, everything from the, 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 the CT scans, MRI scans, very expensive, you gotta do the taps, you gotta do the biochemistry, and when they finally realize that this could be, indeed, it could be some form of dementia or the beginnings of dementia, I remember Laurel said, this is something that actually starts 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years in some cases of 
drip, 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 drip damage, your body's trying to respond to it, it's further damage, and the older you get, the less likely you are, the less prone you are to recover. So it's over a period of time, and we know about, I'm gonna show you some pictures about some of what we're finding out. But the point is this, over 99% of drugs that they have for Alzheimer's disease or dementia simply don't do much to slow the progression of the disease. Now, they can help in terms of, uh, for a period of time, helping with your memory, but in terms of the actual pathology itself, not so much. And the, the latest drug that came out, super expensive drug, um, uh, is $56,000 per year. You, you would have to be have an IV every month for the rest of your, year, your life. It has some complications like brain, 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 bleed, and brain swelling. So there isn't much hope there. Uh, not, much, not much promise. Uh, you could talk, tell the, the caregivers to manage and help uh, manage the person, but how much, how long are you going to be able to do that for? Many times you want to have something that will help, that will help basically in a natural way, help the body and the brain to recover and to, and to heal itself. And I'm going to get to that in a minute. What really is Alzheimer's disease? Because unless we understand what's going on under, under the hood, unless we really understand what's going on under the hood, you probably won't be able to do to really affect it. So the common, the common information everybody has heard about amyloid plaques, tau tangles, anybody? Amyloid plaques? Okay, so what is the, com the common dogma is that there are, there are protein plaques that are filling up in your brain and they are sort of strangling, strangling your brain, your nerves, your synapses, and they're stopping them from functioning, and eventually the brain dies. It's a little bit more than that. Here's another picture to your left, I believe. To your left, that's a, the picture of a brain that has lost about one third of its total mass. That's what happens at the tail end of life when the patient, after the 10 years, that, uh, that, that uh, Laura mentioned, after 10 years, usually seven to 10 years, the patient eventually succumbs to the disease. They, by that time, they've lost a third of their brain mass. So it's not just about memory, it's about, somebody described Alzheimer's disease as not just memory loss, but brain failure. And yeah, that sounds a lot more scary, right? And I think we need to start looking at it that way. It's not just memory loss. Okay, it's basically is this, the brain is, it is, it is shutting down. The entire brain is shutting down. It's not just a defect in memory. And that's why as, as it progresses, you usually start to notice, notice when you are facing memory loss, having problems with memory. But that's not the only thing, I guarantee you. That is not the only thing that's going on in your brain. There are other things that you may have not have noticed. It may have to do with smell, it may have to do with taste, it may have to do with feelings. But that is going on. The, thing, the reason why memory hits you is because memory is so involved in everything that we do, but that's not the only thing. So when you start looking at it as a problem with the brain, the whole brain, not just a part of it. And I have this picture up here just to show you that this is the whole brain, like we said, but this, everybody knows what this is? What is this? Anybody? Anybody? That is a synapse, that's right. So the, the brain has billions and billions, I don't know who gets to count, to count all these nerves, but the brain has billions and billions of nerves. And the way the brain works is that it sends an impulse from one nerve cell to the next. This has to happen to, to remember something, to feel somebody, to hear something. To, to whatever you're going to do, this has to happen. Whatever the function is, lifting up a, a, a ball, playing with your grandkids, doesn't matter. This has to happen. And what happens is that the, the one nerve cell sends an impulse, sends chemicals to the other nerve cell. That's how it travels throughout the brain. That's how everything is done. I can't overemphasize it. What happens in Alzheimer's disease is that the Alzheimer's disease, unlike other brain conditions, it specifically targets this process and it pulls back. It pulls there are about 500 trillion. Again, I don't know who gets to count these things, but there are about 500 trillion connections like this in the brain. So what the brain does is that on its own, it shrinks. It begins to pull back on these connections. It shrinks those connections, it shrinks those connections. Uh, one of those books by Dr. Dale Bennison that Laurel brought, they, he explains that a lot in his books and he does that very, very well. So it's about the synapses, it's about those connections. 
That is what Alzheimer's disease is after. And once the connections are lost, the nerves themselves, the, the cells themselves will be lost because there's no reason for them to exist. The connections are why they exist. Does that sound like something in real life too? We, I mean, we exist to connect and, and connect, all right? So what is it that triggers this program? Laura well, mentioned a, little, a few of them, and I, I like this, this picture because it's about a movie that just came out recently. Has anybody seen it? Everything, everywhere, all at once. There's a king who came out in a week or two. I'm going to go see it very soon. But I liked, I mean, the title just jumped at me. What happens with brain disorders, especially with Alzheimer's disease? She mentioned a uh, cardiovascular problem with her mother. Uh, other people have concussions. Other people have maybe diabetes. By the way, if you're diabetic, please make sure that your blood sugar is under control because over 60% of diabetics have a high, much higher, oh, excuse me, diabetics have a 60% higher risk of having dementia than the others. You know, the other people who have a higher risk, um, military veterans, uh, women are twice as likely to have it as men do, men, men are, you, you do know that, right? And we're looking into why that is so. But we can put it under three things, insult, injury, or illness. Everybody say that with me, insult? Insult. Injury? Illness. No. Come on, people. Let's try it again. Insults. Insults. Injury. Injury. And illness. Yeah. All right. Good job. Thank you. All right. So this is another movie. Concussion about football players who are had repeated hits to the head. Soccer players as well at, uh, at risk too. So you want to watch out for that as well for your grandkids. Um, uh, I mentioned military vets and of course diabetes is a big thing. Laura mentioned inflammation. I'm not going to go into that too much, but inflammation is something that is the way your body reacts to what's going on, the way your body reacts to injury, the way your body reacts to toxins. A lot of our food, unfortunately, has a lot of toxins in them uh, with increase and improvement in, in technology. Food is getting cheaper and cheaper. Maybe, well, maybe not now because of what's going on, but even with, she mentioned dairy and gluten and bread and all those things, even the food that we used to think were healthy, some of them have pesticides in them, herbicides in them, they've got steroids, they've got hormones, a lot of things that we're being faced with, even the water that we're drinking has a lot of chemicals in them. So it's, it's, it shouldn't be too shocking that we are being bombarded. If you hear me say, anybody say that we're being bombarded by all kinds of toxins, and at some point the brain just basically says enough. It says enough, and it begins to shut down by itself. Now, obviously, if you have the genes for it, it's, it's kind of, it's, the threshold is lower, but really, anybody, if you live long enough, especially after the age of 65, and you're not being careful about how you live, you are going to be affected. And I have, I actually did a cute thing where I give to my patients and to my clients. It's called the Dirty Dozen, and they all, they all start with the letter I, and everything from inflammation to insulin sensitivity to injury and all those different things. So it kind of like lists out all the different things. In that book, he has, he has about 36. Yeah, that's too much for me. <laughs> I try to go with it. I try to, I try to make it simple and easier to, to, to follow. So um, I have this picture here. Uh, we grew up watching the Incredible Hulk, the real Incredible Hulk. And I have this picture here saying, uh, to show you that this is what eventually happens when his eyes turn green. All bets are off, right? I mean, you're in trouble. <laughs> so again, I just wanted to write this out. So there's a switch. That flipped apparently, there's a switch that is flipped at some point in time when the brain begins to turn on itself and it shuts down. So it's not just about memory loss, it's not just about the, the, the certain cells are damaged and we have to recover them, it's your brain turning against yourself. And that's what we have with the incredible hook. So what do we do? Okay, that's, we've Talked enough about the bad news. Let's go to the good news and let's see if we can, we can do something about it. So obviously you want to abort the program. You want to stop the brain from being what it's doing. You also want to repair the damage. You want to restore function. Does that make sense? That's really what you want to do. Okay. Um, and he mentioned it too in his book that it's tragic because you, one pill isn't going to do it. Excuse me. Huh. So it, 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 if you. Once you understand that, that 
it's everything. There's so many things happening at once. And you're talking about the most complex piece of biomachinery in the known universe. One pill is not going to do it. And yes, we're spending billions of dollars on pills. And yes, to some extent they work and they're safe. And you have to follow the guidelines if you're a doctor or a neurologist. But you've also got to think about how the brain works and to focus on providing the brain with what it needs to function. Doesn't that make sense? Mm -hmm. You've got to feed the brain. You've got to nurture the brain. You've got to convince, and I like to use this term, you've got to cajole and convince the brain to shut off that program if that program has been initiated. You've got to provide it with a reason to say, it's safe now, everything is okay, you can go back to protecting yourself. Don't shrink, don't pull back anymore, come out into the open, the sun is out, the rain is, the storm is over, there's peace, there's calm, it's okay. And slowly the brain will come back. But unless you do that, and unless you do the right things, it's not gonna happen. So, um, again, I just kind of like harken back to our work with brain disorders. We, we publish, we eventually publish a paper based on our approach, which I'm going to talk about in a few minutes where it was published, it's on the NIH, National Institutes of Health website, where we basically, using the same approach, we showed the results we're getting with kids. Uh, we're still working on one for adults as well. So, as we said, let's talk about what to do. The brain is a complex piece of machinery. It doesn't depend on one thing. The brain has support from about seven or six areas. I have it here, you've got to focus, number one, on feeding the brain cells. Everybody say feeding the brain cells. Feed the brain cells. Let's feed, let's feed our brain cells. That's what makes sense. What are, the, what are the nutrients that the brain needs to survive? We've got to work on that. But not just that, you've got to also support the nervous system, the endocrine, your hormones, especially estrogen, has a huge role on protecting the synapses, not just the brain cells, but the synapses. And one of the reasons they're looking at is that women tend to drop off in the, after menopause. They tend to drop in the estrogen just really a lot more. And so they tend to have it more. That's one reason why they tend to have Alzheimer's disease more than men do. Men, because they have testosterone, they can convert their testosterone to what? Estrogen. And so that's one of the things they're looking at. Not, not, not the only thing. Was one of the things that they're looking at to say, this is one of the reasons why they're doing that. I have this picture here, it's, I call it the central governing system. There are about 12 systems in your body, your cardiovascular system, your nervous system, your, your bone and joints, whatever. There are three, these three control all the rest. This is your, your of course the brain stands at the top, and that's why I have it, um, well your mind, emotions, but your brain, uh, Your brain, your the hippocampus, hippo, hypothalamus represents your brain, right? And it controls the endocrine system, the immune system, and all that. We're now finding out that even the immune system has a key part in memory and uh, and, and cognition. All right, let me quickly jump ahead. So we have to we have to address the brain. We have to address the hormones. Ensure that the your your hormones are balanced, or that your body is producing hormones in the right balance. You got to address the immune system. If your cardiovascular system, if your blood vessels aren't supplying your brain, it's not going to get enough oxygen. It's not going to get the nutrients that it needs to function. Yes. Just think about this. Your brain is two percent of your body weight. Twenty percent of your energy and your nutrients go to the brain. Your brain requires that to function. Think about that. Two percent. Just two percent of your body weight or your body mass, but yet it requires over twenty percent of your oxygen. 20% of the nutrients in your body. So you know that if you don't supply those things, you're already at fault. And of course, the older you get, the less blood flow you get. So you, so, I mean, there are studies that show that the older you get, the less blood flow to specific parts of your brain, especially the memory centers. So there are things that you can be done to help to boost that blood flow to the different parts of your, body, of your, of your brain. And of course, you, None of this is going to happen without nutrients, and that's why we focus on nutrients a lot. The human body heals itself. And likewise, the human brain heals itself. And proper nutrition is what provides it with the resources it requires.
requires to accomplish that task. This is a brilliant guy. And so, of course, the digestive system. She mentioned the digestive system, how she used to have a lot of problems, Laurel did, uh, with uh, intolerances and allergies and all that. If your digestive system is dealing with a lot of intolerances, if you're lactose intolerant, if you're gluten sensitive, if you're dealing with casein or milk problems, you are not going to get much help from your diet because that has to be solved. The brain and the gut uh, play a very, 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 very central role in, in working well. If I jump to the next one, gum disease, the gum, your teeth is part of your digestive system. They are relating a lot of problems to the brain and to the cardiovascular system, to the to gum disease, periodontitis. So you, you need to ensure that your teeth are healthy. So it makes your, it makes your dentist one of your best friends. And of course, the last and not the least, we're going to be talking about how to nurture the, the cells themselves. So you've got to give the brain cells what they need. These are the most basic things. Now we deal with other more complex com formulations uh, where we, we focus on strengthening the brain cells and strengthening the synapses. But at the most basic, at the most basic, you really don't need to do a test for these things. And again, like I said, you guys are great. This is a beautiful place, so clearly most of you can afford to do your medical tests and all those things and to make sure you have the right uh, levels of the different things. But I work in an environment, like I said, where we don't have the access to these things. So we just assume, and it's a good assumption because your brain needs, most people are deficient in this. So we just give this, these, and even if you give too much, it's not going to hurt you. Your, brain, your, your body just takes what it needs and gets rid of the rest. So there's really, really little risk of having a toxicity. The last thing there is, is, is MCTs, uh, medium, called medium chain triglycerides. This lady, Dr. Newport, both her and her husband are medical doctors. He had dementia. She went to find out what to do, and she found out that MCT oils and coconut oils could make a huge, huge difference in, in, his, in his brain health. She wrote a book about it, and she tells a story, and there were significant improvements. Uh, I just want to mention vitamin D3. Everybody has heard about it, right? Yes? COVID-19 has brought it out to the open, I hope. But most people are deficient. If you haven't tested for vitamin D3, please do. But you really don't have to test. You just need to make sure that you have vitamin D. At least take the normal levels, right? I mean, black people are much more deficient in vitamin D than white people are. So we are definitely deficient. So I take, I take a lot myself on a daily basis. But please speak to your doctor about that. Vitamin C, as it doesn't get any more, any more basic than vitamin C. If your vitamin C levels are low, there's a good chance your brain is under fire. So you need to ensure that your vitamin C levels are in order. I know we still have to do a quick yoga thing, so I'm just going to say, let me just wrap this up. I just want to say this, thank you for listening. Please remember, you've got to feed your brain. If that's the one thing that you take from this lecture, there's a lot of other things you need to do, like sleep and exercise, you, and walking around, muscle strength is very important. Muscle strength, especially the strength of your limbs, being able to move around, super important. Laura has a story about her mother too that she needed, uh, that, that, that she, if she had known better, she would have strengthened. Focus on strengthening the limbs. Very, very important where Alzheimer's disease is concerned. But the most important is to feed your brain. So thank you for listening. Laura, I'll get back to you. Thank you. You want a question? Okay. Yeah, do, you, you want us to do it first? Okay, all right. Yes, ma'am. I, I kind of wanted to go back to where you mentioned the three eyes, the injury, and um, is there any connection that's been proven between having some kind of surgical procedure and having anesthetics that can contribute to loss of memory? Absolutely, yes. I, and by anesthetics, you mean anesthesia? Yes. Yes. Huge connection, yes, between anesthesia and uh, even especially repeated surgeries and uh, anesthesia. Uh, one of the things we re I we strongly recommend is that before you go into your surgery, you take specific supplements. After your surgery, you take specific supplements to help you recover. 
you have to do that right away. Don't wait. Especially vitamin C, vitamin D, and zinc. And of course, the B vitamins. Very important. So uh, that's what you call preemptive. You've you got to preempt that kind of thing. You've got to attack that. So yes, unfortunately, there's a connection. Can I add to that? So did everybody hear her question about... So her question was, is there a connection between general anesthesia and memory loss? And Dr. David's answer was yes. 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 Um, I'll just piggyback on his suggestion for um, emphasizing specific nutrients before and after to minimize impact. If you have to have a surgery, you can talk to your doctor ahead of time and say, could I do a local? So my great aunt had to get knee replacement and heard about you know, the, the negative impacts of general anesthesia and said, you know what, don't put me out. Just put me in la-la land a little bit and numb me at my knee. And many doctors, especially for people who are older, will comply if it's possible. Are there any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Say, say it again. Say it. I, that, I love the way you say it. Say Baltimore again. At a church home hospital on Broadway, uh -huh. which is across the street from that very large hospital, um, was one of the first hospitals to have a dementia unit. Okay. And I remember my mother going through Alzheimer's. It was like a secret. She would, she would talk to either me or my sister or her grandchildren. She would use the word fearfully, I'm crazy, it's really very sad, but they have a dementia unit, and we spent the last year of her life there, and at a certain point, she decided to stop eating, and we felt that was really important to respect that, and so she died peacefully down. So I just wanted to share that experience. Thank you. It's, it's hard. I, I mean, and one can't even imagine what people have to go through especially in the last few months. Yeah. You want to do the... Sure. Okay. So we thought it would be good to end with something relaxing. <laughs> Sometimes this information can be stressful. And actually, 